The Treasure of Alpheus Winterborn by John Belairs, Chapter 13. Anthony was so excited that he felt as if he were going to jump right out of his skin. He wanted to run up and down the room, screaming at the top of his voice, but he was afraid that his folks would think he had lost his mind. So he kept his screams in and stood there, tense, clenching his fists. His face felt flushed and his ears burned. What should he do? Well, emergency or no emergency, flood or no flood, he had to call up Miss Eels and tell her. He simply had to. Down the stairs, Anthony ran. He picked up the phone and asked for the, oper for the operator to give him Miss Eels' number. Fortunately, Keith and his folks were still busy upstairs packing. They didn't know that he was downstairs on the phone. Not that it would have made any difference to Anthony at this, at this point. He would have called Miss Eels even if the whole town had been standing around listening. Hello? Hey, Miss Eels! Boy, am I glad I glad to hear your voice, he fairly shouted. It's me, Anthony. There was a lot of crackling no sounds on the telephone line, like those, lightning, like those lightning sometimes causes. For a moment, Anthony thought he heard another voice, but then Miss Eel shouted in his ear, Good grief, Anthony! What's the matter? What's happened? In a breathless voice, Anthony told Miss Eels where he thought the treasure was, and he explained how he had figured it out. Good heavens, well, you know you may be on to something. I won't guarantee it, because there has always been a, f a false lead in this treasure hunt, as you well know. But I must say, it's a very ingenious guest. Congratulations! What do you think, Miss Eels? Do you think we should go down and get it out now, huh? Oh, I don't know about that. It's been there for quite a few years now, and it can stay there a little longer, if it's there. I would suggest that we wait until this ridiculous flood crisis is over with. Are you sure? You don't think somebody else might grab it before we do? Not a chance. Nobody else besides us is looking for the treasure except Hugo Philpotts, and he thinks it was in that stupid mirror. Look, Anthony, I'd love to go on chatting, but I've got to go pack and do some other things before I leave. I'll see you up at the academy. Okay, Miss Eels, hey, I just had a great idea. You seem to be full of them this evening. What is it? Why don't you bring your chess set and meet me somewhere so we can play a game while we're waiting to see if there's going to be a flood or not? How about it, huh? Hmm, sounds like a good plan to me. Why not? Okay, I'll pack my set and tell you what. I'll meet you at the main entrance of the classroom building of the academy, where the pillars are. Do you know where I mean? Anthony thought a minute. Yeah, I guess I do. All right, Miss Eels. I'll meet you there by the pillars. When do you think you'll get there? No telling exactly. I have to finish up a few things here first. I'll see you when I see you. As my father used to say, so long now and keep dry. Goodbye, Miss Eels. Anthony hung up the phone. He stood there a moment think he stood there a moment thinking about the treasure. He had half a mind to ignore Miss Eels' advice and run down and run down away and run down right away and dig the treasure out. But at this point Anthony's mother came charging down the stairs with a suitcase in her hand. Anthony Monday, what on earth are you doing standing there with that foolish look on your face? Is your bag packed? Uh huh. I'm all ready to go, Ma. Well, you don't look like it. Haven't you got any sense, Anthony? Go get your bag and take it to the car. Hurry up. Get a move on, for heaven's sake. Okay, Mom. Anthony dashed up the stairs and got his bag. A few minutes later, he was in the back seat of the car with Keith. His mom was in front and his dad was driving. They pulled out of the driveway and joined the long line of cars that was creeping slowly through the streets in the pouring rain. As they drove, Anthony saw soldiers standing on the sidewalks. They were using walkie-talkies. At one corner, he saw a jeep pulled up on a lawn. Two helmeted guardsmen sat in it, watching the long procession of cars crawl past. Rain beat on the roof of the car. The Mondays moved, and moved on at a snail's pace, staying just a few feet behind the car in front of them. Anthony saw a long, double row of taillights ahead of him. It was crawling slowly up the hill, heading for the high ground, for the academy. Immaculate Conception Academy was a Catholic girls' school. The girls had already been sent home for their Easter vacation. Now nuns and volunteer workers were busy making beds and hanging up sheets to divide the bigger rooms and the smaller ones so that people could sleep and have a little privacy. But everybody hoped it wouldn't be necessary for the people from the lower part of the town to spend the night there. With luck, the walls of sandbags would hold and the refugees would be able to go back to their homes before morning. But the river was still rising and rain was coming down in buckets. No one really knew what was going to happen. Around nine o'clock in the evening, the Monday's car pulled into a parking lot out behind the main classroom building of the academy. A policeman stood nearby, waving the traffic on. He wore a wet black slicker with a white stripe across it, and he was waving a flashlight. Rain dripped from the peak of his cap. Mr. Monday nosed the car into a parking space. 
With their baggage, the Mondays trotted up the walk to the back entrance of the main classroom building. Inside was a policeman with a bullhorn who told them to go up to the third floor. The marble stairs were wet and slippery because men in galoshes had been marching up and down them. The Mondays walked down a long, dark corridor and stopped outside a lighted room. Inside, mattresses had been laid out on the floor. A coffee urn steamed in one corner, and there was a steel cart loaded with sandwiches and other goodies. A nun in a long black habit was there to meet them. Hello, I'm Sister Louisa. This is where I'm going to be staying, and your name is... Monday, said Anthony's dad. I'm Howard Monday, and this is my wife, and these are my sons, Keith and Anthony. It's real nice of you folks to set things up this way, the nun smiled. Thank you. We hope you'll be able to return to your home before long. But if not, this place is yours to stay as long as you like. Make yourself comfortable. The Mondays put down their suitcases and sat on some chairs that were arranged nearby. The mattresses had clean sheets and blankets on them, but nobody thought about sleeping. It was only a little after nine, and they were all terribly excited. Mr. Monday wandered out into the hall and started talking to a friend of his he had seen passing by. Mrs. Monday got out her, her knitting, and Keith started reading a book. Anthony was all at loose ends. He began pacing up and down and glancing at his watch. He was eager for Miss Eels to get there. She had told him that she would meet him at the main entrance of the academy as soon as she got settled. Had she arrived yet? There was no way of knowing. There were two big dormitories with hundreds of rooms in them. And there was this building. She could be anywhere. Mom, said Anthony after a while. Could I go downstairs and look around? I won't go away. I'll just stay near the building. Mrs. Monday looked up. Oh, I guess so. But don't get in the way of the policemen. They have a job to do, you know. I'll be back in half... I'll be back in half an hour, you understand? Sure, Mom, I will. Goodbye. Anthony put on his raincoat and rain hat and walked down the long, dark corridor, the two flights of stairs on the first... and two flights of stairs on the first floor. There were lots of people milling around and talking. Anthony slipped through the crowd, and before long he found himself out in front of the building under the tall, pillared porch. Below him lay the town. There were lights on here and there, but most of the houses were dark. He wondered if there were any people who had refused to leave their homes. Where was Miss Eels? Anthony felt she ought to be there by now. It looked as though most of the people from his part of town had already arrived. The parking lot was jammed. Darn it, why didn't she get here? Anthony wanted to talk to her about the great discovery he had made. And then a horrible thought struck him. What if Mrs. Eels had had an accident? What if she were lying unconscious somewhere? There was no one around it to help if something had happened. She might lie there for hours and then drown when the floodwaters came rushing into the town. Anthony didn't know why this worrisome thought had come into his head, but once it was there, he couldn't seem to get it out. The trouble was it all seemed so very likely that Miss Eels would have an accident of some kind. Anthony began to get panicky. The more he thought, the more thoroughly convinced he became that something had happened to her. He looked around. He felt helpless. What could he do? At the end of the driveway was a police car. Its light, its blue light revolved slowly, and its motor was idling. Maybe he better try to get help. He ran down the drive to the police car and rapped on the window. The policeman rolled down the window. Yeah, what do you want? Please, officer, there's a friend of mine down in the town, and I think maybe something's happened to her. Could I maybe go down to her house with you and make sure she's okay? The policeman was tired. It had been a long, hard night, and he didn't feel like being polite. Look, kid, if I ran around every place everybody asked me to go, I wouldn't know which end was up. Your friend is okay. What'd you say his name was? It's not a man. It's a lady. It's Miss Eels, the lady who runs the library. Oh, her. Well, don't you worry about her, son. She's a pretty smart old chicken. She's probably already up here in one of these rooms taking a snooze. Yeah, but she promised to meet me. At this point, the policeman's car radio started to squawk. A red light on the panel lit up. Sorry, kid, I got work to do, said the cop. He rolled up the window and started fiddling with the dial on his car radio. Then he picked up the microphone, said something into it, and drove off. Anthony stood there in the middle of the driveway, watching him go. Should he go find another cop? No, it wouldn't do any good. Everybody would think he was just a crazy kid with a lot of silly ideas. He stood there, thinking a moment longer. Then he set out on a dead run down the driveway. He was running fast, pumping his arms. He passed the stone gate posts at the entrance to the academy's grounds, then slogged downhill through the wet, elbows and knees pumping up and down like pistons. It would be a long run, but he could do it. He was a wiry kid and a good runner. He would save Miss Eels if he could. Anthony ran through the deserted streets. He splashed in and out of puddles. 
The gutters were running with rainwater. He could hear it gurgling down into the storm sewers as he ran. I'll save you, Miss Eels, he said to himself as he ran. Don't worry, I'll save you. Another thought was running through his mind, too. It was about the treasure. He knew where it was now, or he thought he knew. It was in the library. Miss Eels had said that the treasure would be safe there for the time being. But Anthony wasn't so sure about that. He was still worried that somebody might sneak in and grab it before he got there. Anthony was running down Division Street now. The houses were all dark. Nobody was around, not a soul. The evacuation of the lower part of the town had been pretty complete. Once, as Anthony was crossing a street, he saw a jeep cruising past several blocks away. It was probably somebody sent by his mother, he thought. Somebody who wanted to drag him back to the academy. Well, he wasn't going. Not till he found Miss Eels. His mother thought he was stupid, but grown-ups were the ones who were stupid, not him. Maybe he had been wrong about the treasure, but he was on the... He was on the right trail now. As soon as he made sure that Mrs. Eel, that Miss Eels was safe and sound, they would go get the treasure together. And then wouldn't everybody be surprised, including Hugo Philpotts. Anthony grinned. It was a determined, stubborn grin. He would fix them. He would show them all. His legs ached and there was a pain in his side, but he gritted his teeth and ran on. Sometime later, Anthony turned onto the sidewalk in front of Miss Eels' house. It had stopped raining, but lightning still flashed now and then. Thunder rumbled in the distance. The storm was moving off across the bluffs into Wisconsin. Anthony looked like a drowned rat. He was dripping with rain and sweat. Halfway down Division Street, he had torn off his raincoat and hat so that he could run faster. He saw a light burning in Miss Eels' living room. Her garage doors were closed, so he couldn't really tell if her car was there or not. When he caught his breath, he ran up the sidewalk and banged on the front door. He pushed the bell several times. Without waiting for an answer, he turned the doorknob. The door swung open. Inside, it was empty. Miss Eels was not to be found. Anthony turned and walked back toward the front door. Help! Help! A cry, faint and feeble, came from the cellar. Anthony ran back to the cellar door and looked down into the darkness. He could just barely see something or somebody lying huddled at the bottom. Down here! Down here! Please help me! I'm hurt! Frantically, Anthony fumbled for the switch that turned on the cellar light. He flipped it, but nothing happened. But by now, his eyes were getting used to the darkness. With the hall light on, he could pick his way down. Slowly, cautiously, he started down the steps. At the bottom, he found Miss Eels. A Anthony, is that you? Anthony's eyes filled with tears. Yeah, it's me, Miss Eels, he said, in a, he said in a thick, choked voice. Are you all right? Miss Eels made a funny sound. It might have been a laugh. <laughs> Not really, she said faintly. I seem to keep passing out and I've cut myself somehow. There's two bumps on the head in one year. Not good, not good. Miss Eel's voice was wandering dreamy and dreamy as if she were talking in her sleep. She tried to raise herself on her hands, but the effort was too much. She collapsed unconscious on the cellar floor. And that's the end of chapter 13.